Hey everyone, welcome back to Make It Happen Mondays, where we talk about sales, business, entrepreneurship, personal growth, mental health, and everything in between with guests who I truly respect and I think make a positive impact on the world around us. And today's conversation is with my good friend, Jason Bay. Now, Jason is the founder and CEO of Outbound Squad, and they do pretty much exactly what I do. <laughs> they train reps and companies on prospecting skills, specifically focused on front end of the funnel. And in this conversation, we got super tactical. I mean, we started a little bit with some of the challenges around training and finding reps who actually care about their own development and leaning in on them. And then talked about kind of what we skipped over, uh, I think for the past five to 10 years here and how we really need to get back to fundamentals. I mean, both Jason and I are seeing the exact same thing. You know, leadership is telling us that their reps don't even know how to make a cold call these days or carry a conversation. And we really need to get back to those fundamentals because you know, look, the enablement process is broken. You know, we stuff product knowledge down these kids' throats all day long and then expect them to have cool conversations and it just doesn't work that way. But then we got really detailed into multi-threading, which is the topic that I did a blog post on, or actually I did a LinkedIn post on, and Jason saw it and he's like, John, we got to talk about this stuff. So, man, we got tactical on this. We talked about how he leads the conversation and makes some assumptions, but also plays a little bit of the challenger sale. Um, and talks about the outcomes as opposed to the product or the solution. And then talks about have the upfront contract and how to de-risk the purchase, uh, how to set the stage in the initial conversation for multi-threading, and then how to reverse engineer your lost 10 deals so that you can really come back and figure out what is ideal and share that with executives. And he, again, ended with some very tactical things about this pre-email that he sends to executives, how to engage with them throughout and everything else. So hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. And as always, let's make it happen. JB, what's going on, brother? Welcome back to the Make It Happen Monday podcast, my friend. How you doing? Yeah, we were having like quite the conversation right before this, dude. So I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm I had, pumped. <laughs> yeah, this, well, that's why we should probably hit record, right? But it was all AI, like, holy shit, what's going on with it? <laughs> yeah. So we're getting get a little more tactical today. A little, bring it back down to earth, I think. But uh, yeah. talk to give the audience. I mean, you've been on before, but I think it was a while ago. So give the audience a little, yeah. little bit of background here so we can put some context to this conversation because we're going to dive in tactically around cold calling, prospecting, multi-threading, and everything else. But give them some, yeah. uh, give them some history here. Yeah, I run a company called Outbound Squad. We used to be called Blissful Prospecting. And when we got started, we were kind of doing done-for-you prospecting and appointment setting. And uh, did that for a couple of years. And it was really hard, but I got really good at writing cold emails and creating sequences and kind of just building out a process that I would then train and coach mm -hmm. companies through, which is mostly what we do now. Um, we've mostly specialized in outbound up until like probably the last 12 months. We've been talking a lot more about discovery. Mm -hmm multi-threading which we're going to talk about today it's the the prospecting i like to say that happens after you get the first meeting that everyone tends to neglect yep. uh, we've been talking a lot about demos negotiation and really what i have a lot of fun with is i mean you work with a very similar crowd like wow. i love helping young account executives yeah. that are in like their mid-20s that are so eager to learn that are not getting the structure the training the everything basically oh, from their really? organization very large organizations and uh, i love helping those reps you know when you can get something to stick with someone that's like 26 27 and they have the ability to sell to someone that's like 15 years older than them that's like a very yeah. experienced buyer like that stuff's like really cool um and that that's what keeps me pretty energized these days is seeing that that transformation is is really really awesome yeah, that light bulb that pops and you can tell, right? Yeah. Like when you're doing that session and there's 20, 30 reps in the room, not all of them are going to pop, but there's always that two, three, yeah. four that go, ooh, and then you know they got it. Now, actually, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll get into what we talked, what we're talking about as far as prospecting, but let's, I want to lean in on that point for a minute with, um, you know, reps who are really excited to learn uh -huh. because I, you know, I, you probably heard my whole spiel of 10, 60, 30, right? Like somebody yeah. asked me, you know, when, you know, John, you train all these people on the same stuff, how do we differentiate? And I said, 10% in this room are going to take what I tell you and run with it. 60% are they going to do something different because it's easy and 30%, mm -hmm. you know, not going to do shit different. And I always say I play between the give a shit factor and, you know, <laughs> unconscious confidence. But I'm, I'm having a harder and harder time these days finding po people who give a shit. People who do are like really actively want to learn. So with your audience and, and who you work with, where where are those people coming from? 
right? Because there's a lot of people who are legitimately yeah. just going through the motions and I am deathly afraid for them because I'm not, I mean, I'm not worried uh, because I, there's not no skin off my back, right? I mean, they're the ones who are going to be unemployed, but the uh, ones that give a shit like really are elevating and I'm, I'm doing my best to try to find them. So where, where are you seeing the, the sweet spot, if you will, for the groups that you work yeah. with that really care? It's a good question. So we, I work with both sales teams and then we have programs for individuals. And, yep. and one of them is, you know, where they're paying 500 bucks out of pocket per month yep. for, for group coaching and like more access yep. that group. Like you would love being on one of those calls. Sure. It's, yeah. it's like you, you hop on a call, there's 20 people that everyone wants to be there yeah. and they have a deal that they want to walk through or a cold email they want feedback on. That's how I kind of scratch that is for the most part on the sales teams. I take a little bit of a different perspective maybe in this. I don't believe that. I think that 99% of the people want to do good at their job. Mm -hmm. I think there's a very small portion of them that actually want outside development. Uh, that are going to do stuff outside of the nine to five aspect of it. So what I try to do is I try to figure out in the kind of thin slice, every topic. So like mm. multi-threading, if we take that, for example, I'm like, you know what? Most of the people here are probably not going to do anything outside of this call. So how can I teach the 100 level version of this, which right. no one does. Yep. So if there's like one thing that you do, it's Hey, you're going to make sure in that first call, you have a good talk track for how to get other people involved in the next call. So yep. that's the only thing that if you take that away, like you're going to mm -hmm. do that. And I also break up the sessions. We'll do 15, 20 minutes of teaching, 10 minutes of breakout room practice. So I'm like forcing you to practice. Nice. Yep. And I find that like I was just doing one earlier today and I bounce around between the breakout rooms, like a creep with my camera off and the audio right. off. I'm like listening to people. Yep. Yep. So I'm like listening. I'm like, most of the people I think want to get better at their job. I think it's finding a way to like meet the group where they're at or the right. individuals where they're at, knowing that 99% of the people want to do good, but maybe 10% actually really want to be great. Yep. And I've just had to have that ego shattering, you know, kind of look in the mirror where I'm like, I can't help everyone. I can't help yeah. you if you don't want to be helped. And and most importantly, most of you don't really want to change that much, but you will at least listen when you're on the call. Yeah. So it's like, what can I give you? That's like the toddler version. Sure. I don't mean that as an insult, but yeah. like the toddler version of the cold call. It's like, okay, yeah. if you just do a permission based opener and don't pitch your fucking solution in the first yep. 60 seconds, that's a huge win for me. Yeah. Cool. You're going to be better than 80% of the people that do this. So I try to without being too repetitive here. Thin yeah. slice, I think is the, the big thing. And then just coming to the conclusion that for me, it doesn't have to do with my inability to like really break through mm -hmm. and teach this person because great personal trainers fail two thirds of the time with their clients. Yep. So it's unreasonable for me to expect that 80% of people, you know, latch on to this. And I think that's a good lesson for probably sales leaders listening to that. You really got to get people to want to change and most of them are not going to want to. So you just have to accept that. It's a very Buddhist maybe way of thinking about it. Yep. But you just got to accept it and do your best and take advantage of the time that you have with them and make it so easy to implement the thing that you're trying to get them to implement is how I kind of look at it. Yeah, I think it's funny. I think you came to the same conclusion I did, you know, I think early yeah. on because I, I took this training when I, when I, you know, it was called Basho at the time and and it was so good for me, right? I was the one in the front of the room asking questions, digging in. I'm always like, if I go to a training, I'm the wicked annoying one because I don't give a shit who's in the room. I'm sitting front and center and I'm like, okay, what about this? What about that? What about this? Right. Yeah. And so last time it, you sold something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, so, um, so, you know, for me, it was great. It was, it was so, it worked so well that when I had the opportunity to train this stuff, you know, it'd be, this was when we were doing a lot of face to face and, and, you know, there'd be 30, 40 reps in the room. And if you were in the back of the room on your iPhone, not paying attention, I'd be like, yeah, hey, Jason, hey, uh, eyes up, man, come on. Like, because I would try to be like, dude, you got to learn this shit. This stuff's good. Yeah. It works. I promise you, right? So I was trying to reach everybody in the room. And then I kind of came to the conclusion, like, you can't, you know, you can bring a horse to water type of thing. But, yep. uh, and I was like, all right, cool. And that's where I just, I, I legitimately threw up my arms. I said, okay, if you don't care, I don't either. I'm like, I'm not going to, it's just like, almost like, you know, somebody like an alcoholic, right? You can't help an alcoholic unless they decide they need help, right? You can't yep. force it on them to make that change. 
it's the same thing with learning in my experience. And so totally. I, I did kind of micro learn, like, hey, here's a nugget, here's a nugget, here's a nugget, here's a nugget, try that, try that. So at least people would walk away with something, no matter if you were paying attention or not. But it would, but it, but the real satisfaction is when you can see that 10% of the people that can get it and you're like, Ooh, yes. All right. That's why I do this shit. Right. Yep. So leaders, right, especially right. this, this is the, the thing that I'm so bullish on is that, uh, the frontline leaders getting them to give a shit Yeah, because like, that's where the ROI of the training oh, happens is just yeah. the reinforcement of it. And if the, you know, just like I did a call earlier today and it's like the director, it's for a BDR team. Uh, and it's like the director was just not engaging and had his camera off and wouldn't go into the breakout room. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, man? Like, What's you're the, the one that's supposed to set an example for everyone yeah. else. Yeah. So the engagements where I've had really good outcomes is where, like, I was I was working with one I remember, and, and it was like a VP of sales development. But you know, he had a team of like 50 people under him, and it's like this dude participated in the training. He asked questions. He took himself off mute and cut me off in the middle. And I was like, yeah, dude, you know, he's like setting a good example and he's taking feedback in front of everyone. And, uh, I think we need more of that. I think that's where as an organization, they can really invest more. And these frontline leaders, they just get zero training. So it's, it's like, I kind of feel cause every rep I talk to and (laughs) in my, you know, wife got into sales you know also and it's just like hearing her experience i'm like dude it's yeah. kind of hard to fault them a little yeah. bit because they care a lot but they're not being taught how to do their job without micromanaging people through slack and expecting mm-hmm. a five minute response time so that's a whole nother can of worms yeah, you know, not, could, like, yeah. that's uh yeah so that's I, I think where we need to really really focus is those frontline leaders i will tell you and just as a one more point on that that's where I actually think AI is going to make the biggest short-term impact, uh, especially in sales. Yeah, it can help prospect and automate a lot of this other stuff. But really where I think, because managers just don't coach, they don't because they don't have time. And we were talking about this before, like gong, chorus, all those things. Those are fantastic. But even me using them, like if you tell, like if you, if you're one of my reps, right, I got to, and you have a 30 minute call. Okay, that's recorded. Fantastic. But now I have to listen to that call and I have to coach on that call. And, and, and I can't listen to it at 2x because I need to listen for tonality. I need to listen for pitch. I need to listen for the gaps and everything else. So it's going to take me at least a half an hour. And don't tell me I can just jump to pricing, right? Because there, there's context around when that conversation came up. So it's like 45 minutes to an hour to coach on a 30 minute call. If I got 10 reps, that's all I'm doing. And you know, and even though that's probably the most important thing I could do, I got to close deals. I got to do what I can do. So I think actually AI is going to come in great because maybe for somebody like you or me who has been around the block for a little while, like, okay, some of that's a little rudimentary as far as their coaching ability is concerned. But for that 22-year-old kid that's not getting any coaching from their manager, not getting anything, I think AI is going to be an absolute godsend for them. So um, that's the part I'm really actually looking forward to as part of this. So. Yeah, it's like we're in the information age, right? I mean, the, the problem right now is not getting access to information. It's getting good information and getting yeah. it when you need it. Exactly. You know, and having context with it. So yeah, yeah so, it's exciting uh, stuff. Well, yeah, like I said, we can talk about uh, the, the yeah. philosophical side of this house for a little while and what AI is going to do. But let's get tactical here. I mean, one of the things you reached out to me, right? Because I did a post on uh, multi-threading and just some yeah. tips on this. But, you know, what's your, um, let's start with, I'm going to start with prospecting in general and then move to multi-threading. Let's start with what you're seeing working right now because you're on the ground floor, you're working with reps, you're in these war rooms basically like doing, you know, looking at emails and everything else. And I know there's no silver bullet by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, it, what's what do you find working? Is personalization still good? Is it not? Is it relevance? Is it phone? Is it email? Is it social? And obviously, it's all of it. But is there an area where you're leaning into right now? Yeah, I think what we're finding out when this is my first time selling B two B during a recession. Right. Prior to this, I was a college student in 2018, yeah. going door to door selling house painting services. Nice. Um, yeah. So. We saw a little bit of it through COVID, but basically when stuff like this happens, all the gimmicks kind of go out the window. They don't, they don't work anymore. So getting a voice note on LinkedIn is not so special anymore. Dude, I don't know what you're saying. Even video, man. I'm like, video almost feels like a little bit of a gimmick right now where it's like getting people to actually watch the video is the hardest part, but it's like, it feels like such an extra nice to have Mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, So 
do just fundamental basics, I think sure. is, is really where it's at right now. So I, I answered this question the same <laughs> it, that I would have like a year ago. And it's, dude, it's the thing you do. It's, it's a, uh, we, one of the first things I think we even call it the same thing, a messaging matrix, yeah, right? Yeah. The messaging matrix is for the persona that I sell into, what are their top level priorities? What are the Whoa. patterns there? Um, what's status quo? So what's the current solution? People, uh, tools, process, how are they getting the job done? What are the problems that creates for them and the impact of that? Whoa. And then a quick like kind of aspiration. What do they want to do over the next six to 12 months? Whoa. Or an ex- executive, maybe multiple years out. That exercise will never fail you. You just need to do it again if you haven't done it for a while. Yeah. And I think that the what we're starting to see is that there aren't really a lot of new shiny stuff that people are doing from a prospecting standpoint. So if your messaging through email, phone, whatever it might be, does not align with existing priorities, mm-hmm. you're not going to get any like FaceTime. You're not going to get anyone wanted to talk to you. You're not going to get any responses. So I think like really getting back fundamental basics, the actionable thing that you can do is the very first thing I do with a new client is, and no one does this, is you want to run a messaging workshop with your top yep. sellers, get 15, 20 people in a room or five to 10 if you've got a smaller team, and we're going to work through each persona. We're going to spend 30 minutes on persona A, and we're all going to come to a consensus on the common language around their priorities. Mm-hmm. And by the way, doing this with account executives is going to be much more effective. Yep. You want people that sell full cycle. Yep. But this concept of we have to meet our prospects in their world and align with what they care about first before we talk about our thing, it's the most fundamental basic thing that you have been teaching. Like you've been teaching that forever, dude. Yeah. And that is just more important. Um, so I think messaging is super important. I think channels, multi-channel is more important than it's ever been. Yeah. So you better be calling. I feel like people are totally scared of the phones because oh, yeah. the pickup rates low. So if you can figure out a way using, I know you have some opinions on dialers. I'm a fan of yep. using a dialer as long as it helps you personalize. You know, if you, if you take notes yeah. prior and then load it up and call and I'm not blasting like three yeah. different personas at the same time, I'm a huge fan of that. I'm a huge fan of like, using, you know, verified, you know, kind of phone numbers, if you can get that together. Um, But really it just comes down to when someone picks up, like, do you have the chops and the talk track to be able to have a good 30 to 60 seconds? Once you get past that, it's, you know, your odds of getting a meeting are pretty high. Um, LinkedIn, same kind of stuff. I mean, it's, I'm not really suggesting or seeing anything like work that's different. It's just people actually being forced to use like fundamental approaches of not right. talking about your own shit so much and talking more about the other person and then being yep. really diligent and, and account account executive self-sourcing is probably the other big thing that I'm seeing a huge theme yep. of where a lot of the SDR teams are starting to go by the wayside. And as an account executive, I'm happy to dig in there more if you want on tactics, but Love yeah, me. all of a sudden now you got to be good at outbound to be yep. a great account executive, yep. which again, you should have already been doing that before. So nothing crazy new yeah. that I'm seeing. It's the same kind of fundamental stuff. Which is funny because I've, I've talked about that recently. And I, I genuinely think, you know, the past 10 years in sales, we as leadership in a lot of ways or leadership in general has done a disservice to uh, the, the sales population because we've over-engineered the sales process. We've thrown too much technology at it. And all the stats say that with all this technology, we're actually far less efficient and effective than we've ever been. And so now, and and look, we grow at all costs. Here's a ton of money. Go, 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 go. Skip the fundamentals. Who gives a shit, right? Because a 60, 60% quota button seat is better than a 0% quota button seat as you're growing like that. But now that things are hard, now people have to go back and sell. And it, and and they, they don't have the fundamentals. And it's scary to me because just recently, and I, I'm not going to call out any names, but some big ass companies that you would think, holy shit, they know, like they've defined this, like they're the ones who can do this. And I'm talking to their managers and their managers are like, uh, to your point, they, they're still product pitching. You know, I, yeah. I, I don't know about you. I still get people coming to me saying, hey, John, you know, I think we got to make the move to, um, uh, you know, to solution selling because my, my, my reps just pitch too much. And I'm like, you do realize that Xerox came up with solution selling back in the late 70s, early 80s, right? Like that's when solution selling was defined. Like, where the fuck have you been for the past 30 years, 40 years, 50 yeah. years? You know what I mean? Like, but it's still to this day reps. And I'm just curious why you think that is. Like, why do you think that 
that sales with all the education now, right? I mean, we have we have now universities you can get your degree in, but wh- yeah. why are you and I seeing the same thing with fundamentals being so sorely uh, lacking? I I think it's a couple things. There's that's a huge thing that we can kind of unpack, but yeah. there hasn't been a consequence for it. Yeah, that's true. That's the big thing. So I mean, you mentioned this before we were recording. The economy has been really good the last ten years. Yeah, yeah, it's been freaking booming, dude. But I know a lot of people that do what we do now that are not making any money right now, dude. Well, you know, and I think it's uh, there hasn't been a consequence. So things have been really good. So you could reach out if you're working for insert big company name and say I'm with this company. Like that'll get you a meeting. You know, used to a lot. Uh, the other thing though is that I think the way that we enable reps is fundamentally broken. I was just talking to my wife, Sarah, about this uh, right before this, when we were eating lunch. And uh, she's right now, she's, she's Korean and she's trying to become fluent in Korean. So she speaks pretty good Korean right now, but she's going through like this language learning kind of thing. Right. She's got like apps and like a tutor and all this other kind of stuff. She's like, you know, what's weird when you're learning a language, you don't, you know, listen to other people talk in that language for eight hours and then practice it for 20 minutes. Right. Which when we onboard reps, what does enablement do? They take people through like 15 hours, 40 hours of content, and then they have yeah. to do a 20 minute pitch in front of all these executives. Like what? Yes. That is such an unreasonable expectation. Like that's not how you learn. And I see huge companies, the way that they enable reps is like, they're not being taught just fundamental principles. Like Gong's got some great data on, uh, cold call success rates, right? Okay. And the cold calls that end with a positive outcome, it's 55% talk ratio rep, 45% yeah. prospect. I always ask this question when I teach cold calling, like what percentage of the time should you be talking? Everyone thinks less. And I'm like, you're expecting a stranger to drive a conversation with you? Come on. But it's like fundamental things like that that are not being taught, nor yeah. is there an opportunity to, which it sounds like you're going to be spending a lot of time and resources and energy on it. It's like, yeah is how do I practice? Yep. Like, how do I actually practice this? And I think that's been fundamentally broken to where there hasn't been a consequence. The existing enablement that teams get is just like course modules, essentially. Mm-hmm. So reps aren't enabled. And then also there's not a consensus on how things should be done. So you brought up Medic earlier. I, I'm a really big fan of Medic, but like knowing what the acronym stands for and being able to actually execute that are two totally entirely different things. Yes, they are. <laughs> yes, they so are. there's just a lack of consensus on kind of like how to go about stuff. Yeah. And I think that as a as a sales leader, dude, I'm talking with a big company. They have like, well, they're not big. I mean, they're they're decent. It's they have like 250 account executives and they've never done outbound before. Yep. I'm like, are you kidding? Like, I, you've never had these reps do any outbound before, so they don't even know, John, like how to send a cold email. Crazy. So I think there's like some fundamental things that if I'm a VP of sales right now, I'm, I'm going to be like, hey, it's like get back to basics. It's yeah. like getting back to school kind of thing. Yeah. And let's just look at all the 100 level things that we need to do really well. Yeah. And yeah, let's I mean, just create a simple, easy to follow framework for each of those things and start measuring against that. Like, it's just, it's, I hate to be a broken record with the getting back to basics thing, but that's just where it's at right now. No, I could, I mean, look at the end of the day, if you look at almost any successful sports franchise or whatever it is, like they do the fundamentals better than everybody else and they do them consistently better than everybody else. It's not just like, okay, this month we're doing the fundamentals. It's like, no, the baseline is set and they all know that this is what is expected. Now, where they pop is where the creative stuff comes into play, whatever, but yeah, the, I agree with you. I think there there is a need to get back to basics here from a sales standpoint. Learn how to actually have a conversation with somebody without pitching your shit. Ask, you know, be actually yeah. curious and genuine about it, that type of thing. So, well, let's let's get into multi-threading, right? Because I think this is an area. Obviously, all the statistics say that you know there's more people involved in the sales process than ever before, and you know <clears throat> you get ghosted all the time and you know people lean in on a champion and that champion gets laid off moves job you're screwed so what is your approach and let's assume here that we're selling something over ten thousand dollars acv and there's you know four five six people involved in the decision making process uh-huh. and you have your champion and everybody else so where, what's your thought what's your approach like as philosophy on uh, on uh multi-threading and then let's get into super tactical on how you do it 
Yeah, I love this topic. So I'll, I, I learned a lot of these things actually from a good friend. His name's uh, Dan Strauss, and he did strat sales at Zoom Info and Chorus and landed some very big deals when competing against Gong. Nice. And uh, so he taught me a lot of this stuff a while back. And uh, I think fundamentally, there's a couple of things. One, there's always this fear that, I mean, this is what I hear every time with multi I don't want to alienate my champion and yeah. like all of this other stuff. I don't want to go around their head and what they shut down the deal. I think the first thing is like, take the lead. Yep. So you need to think about it like this. I always think about running a sales process, like being a good host. So John, if, if you and your wife were over at uh, Sarah and my place and you guys were coming over for dinner, um, there would be an expectation. I would assume that I would probably do the cooking. Like we would have some stuff there for you. There might be a table for us to sit at. And I would kind of like, let you know, yep. like, well, first thing I ask you to do is like, Hey, take your shoes off. Yeah. <laughs> This is an Asian household. Okay. Um, <laughs> but like there would be some guidelines and parameters so that you don't like, you know what to do, right? Yep. But you're allowed to participate in that. I might ask you, hey, what do you want to drink? You know? So there's room for participation, but there's also like me setting kind of guidelines and boundaries around what's going to happen so that I can like lead you through that experience. And in the sales process, you have to lead the buyer through not how to buy your stuff, Part number two is like how to get a great outcome. And this is where I think there's a lot of confusion in that you don't even know if they want to buy your thing yet or if they're even sold on changing. Do you want to talk about how to get a great outcome? Because that's the part of the buyer's journey that's neglected. People talk about awareness, consideration, interest, all this other stuff. Well, the buyer doesn't give a shit about that part. They care about buying something and then getting the outcome it's supposed to get. I mean- Pause there for a second, because I, I want to, because this leans, this this hits on something I've talked about a lot, which is there's two types of buyers, right? In well, there's a lot of type of buyers, but there's two groups in in this example: sophisticated versus unsophisticated, right? And sophisticated, so unsophisticated buyers are. I've never really done this before. I'm looking into this. I was told, you know, so I got to go through the motions. And I 100 percent agree. We have to lead them through the process because they've never done this before. You do a little challenger sale, you know, hey. You make this decision once a year. I help people make it every day. Let's go, right? And here's the guidelines. But for the sophisticated buyer, right? The one that you all hear the stats by the time somebody comes to us, they're already 60 to 70% of the way through the sales process, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. What do you do to that? Like, how do you how do you lead, right? Because in a lot of cases, you, you want to make that sale frictionless. Like you want to get out of the way and make that, because if you put them through a process, you're going to lose them. So how do you yeah. deal with, in in that scenario with what you just mapped out there, the sophisticated buyer who's done some due diligence, who knows what's going on, who's gotten to the point where they're in this conversation, they just want to see price. They just want to see that feature. How do you calm them down a little bit and make sure that you lead that process without getting in their way? Yeah, I want to preface this with, I rarely see that that situation just because mm-hmm. it's like, when you hop on a sales call, you're that sophisticated buyer. Yeah. But it's like, for us, I rarely see... I don't know about you. I really have an SVP want to talk to me on the very first conversation or like a chief revenue officer. So I would just like kind of keep that in mind. It depends on kind of who you are and what you're selling. Um, so this, the sophisticated buyer, the, the talk track sounds a lot like this. So, um, John, obviously you've been a VP of sales at XYZ company for a decade. You, you probably brought in trainers before in the past, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, cool. So there's a couple things that we do um, they're maybe a little bit different than what you might've done before. And we've gotten some really good results with companies like Gong, Medallia, Zoom. You're trying to get to a third of your AE's pipeline being self-sourced. Do you want me to kind of walk you through like how we were able to get that outcome for them? Is that cool mm-hmm. if I share that every time they say yes? Sure. Yep. Um, hey, one of the perspectives, obviously you have a lot of really good direction from a senior level on like the vision, where the yep. sales org is going over the next couple of years. There's some other parties I would recommend that we get involved as well. Sales enablement is typically going to want to have their eyes on content so they can reinforce it. And I would love to get some frontline leaders on a call as well so we can get their perspective boots on the ground. Like their buy-in, I find if we don't have it, we can do everything we want from a training standpoint, but they're not going to implement it well with their reps unless they really like and resonate with the content. So with that being said, I'm happy to give you price, but can I make a recommendation based on how I've seen it work really well with a few other organizations on, on what we could do for a next step? I always get a yes with that. Yeah, I like so it. the sell the outcome is I'm not going to walk them through how to buy my stuff. I'm going to walk them through how other organizations get great outcomes because, again, I'm curious your experience too, if it's different. Yep. Then when I get, 
this is a situation we should talk about too, because the most common situation every rep listening to this is on is a manager or a director of something hops on that first call. It's hardly right. ever someone above the line. Yep. So for me, a lot of times that's a sales enablement manager from a well-known company that right. I want to work with yep. coming inbound. And I look at it, I'm like, oh, fuck. Okay, I got my work cut yeah. out with this one, you know? Um, but what I'm thinking about through that process is like, how do I educate them not on how to buy my thing, but like what the best organizations are doing to get a great outcome. Because when they bring that senior person in, the number one question I get asked is like, they want proof points. Yep. Oftentimes it's a 10 minute conversation, zero bullshit at the beginning. They say, who have you done this for? And what kind of outcome have you gotten? They're thinking, how can I de-risk this Let's decision? Up. Yep. So that's what I want to supply to the senior person. And I think there's a little bit of ego stroking that you should do too, like I did well, there. Hey, you've sure. been doing this for a long time. I imagine yep. you have a really good idea of what you're looking for. I've also been doing this for a while mm -hmm. <laughs> and have yep. talked and sold and gotten great outcomes with these other companies. Do you want me to share how we've done that? Yeah. And if you pull that off correctly, now they're bought into multi-threading because there's a purpose for it. Yep. McKinsey's got another stat. I think it's 71% of change management initiatives fail. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like seven out of 10 times when a company brings in a new process or new tool, like a lot of the clients that, that we have that sell, it doesn't work. No. Nope. Yep. So people want to de-risk the purchase. That's what you kind of need to think about. So that take the lead piece mm -hmm. and the selling the outcome versus the solution. That's what I want to do is I really want to come in and be that trusted advisor that everyone talks about. Like you need to give them advice here. That's yeah. what they're looking to you for. So if you're a rep and you're listening to this, because a lot of them might be fairly new, this is the type of stuff that you can pick up from your more seasoned account executives. Listen to their calls, ask them, talk to customer success. Hey, the customers that you seen get the best outcomes from our solution, what do they do differently than everyone else? Mm -hmm. And now I have an insight or two and multi-threading is not this big, Thing that happens at the end of a call when I have two minutes left, and I need to yeah. secure a step. I need to do the as a VP. No, it's it's a seed that I planted at the very beginning of the first conversation. You know, you know, it's funny. I you know, this is mea culpa on my part. You know, you know the sailor upfront contract, right? Like, yeah. I remember when I was 22, 23 years old. I sat through a sailor training, and you know, typical you know suit that's three sizes too big. You know, guy who's probably hasn't sold shit in years. And he's and he's explaining the three the you know, for a contract. I'm like, and I just rolled my eyes at the whole thing. I was like, this is so fucking cheesy. I'm never going to do this, right? So for legitimately 20 years of my career, I shit on the upfront contract. I was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, right? And then Gong Data actually came out with with some stuff. So the best sales reps use the upfront contract to set the stage, and yeah. you know, it was all about closing. I was like, huh. All right. Well, let me let me kind of revisit this. And and it was actually right around the time when Morgan was on uh, was on the squad with me. And he was having a little hard, he was having a really hard time, you know, nailing down next steps. And so we kind of role played it out and we, st we started implementing the sailor upfront contract in our style. And it was along the lines of what you did. And it's using the word typically, right? So it's like, hey, Jason, you know, here's a quick little agenda. We, I want to make sure we like, and this is for a scheduled call, obviously for a cold call, it's a little bit different, but for a scheduled call, it's like, hey, Jason, you know, I sent you over a little quick agenda. Just make sure we get that most out of this. I'm probably sure you didn't see it. You know, here's a few things I want to make sure that we cover today. Um, what else do you want to, what else do you want to get out of our call today? Right. And then you work through what they want to get out and they say, okay, cool. Look, you know, if we get through all of this stuff, typically the next steps are we bring in enablement, we bring in VP of sales X, we bring in that so that we can actually really put this pieces together and get everybody's insights. So we're doing the right thing here. So if we were to do all that, would you feel comfortable taking that next step with us? Right. So it, really all it is, is a trial close and it's something similar, not the same exact yeah. talk track to what you have, but you're basically leading, like setting the stage of this is how it's done right. And do you want to do it right? Yes, I want to do it right. Okay, so if we do it right, then the next steps are these things. Is that cool? And if they say yes, well, then at the end of that conversation, then it's a natural close, right? It's a, Now it's a very assumptive close. We're like, all right, cool, Jason. We did all that stuff. Fantastic. So now when do you want to, you know, when do you want to set up that call with enablement or whatever it was? And by implementing that for Morgan, it actually gave him a lot more confidence because if they said no to it, right? then you kind of knew what you were up for. Like, this is just a discovery call then. This is just a, uh, I'm going to show you what I got and it is what it is and I'm going to treat it a certain yep. way. But if they say yes, then the conversion ratios were through the roof. So I like the way yep. that you positioned it though. I like the way that you handle that a little bit better where, you know, when things go right effectively, the, let me let me paint this outcome of the best clients that I work with, this is what they do. 
Right? Do you want to yeah. be that best client? Great. If not, like we could end this conversation pretty quick because I don't understand the point. Yep. Oh God, so much there. I, one little thing I want to say is when you get an executive on a call, I interviewed uh, Henry Schock, CEO yeah. of the Zoom Info on our podcast, and I asked him what he wants to get out of a sales call if it's yeah. a big enough deal that he has to hop on something yeah. right? when they're being sold something. He's like, dude, I want to know what a best in class peer is doing. Are you working with a, a peer that I know? Yeah. And what is the best in class thing that I can take back to my team? Mm-hmm. So when you get an executive on, share something helpful with them. This is, this is what you do. Um, so I would say one other exercise that's super important is like, you need to reverse engineer the perfect deal. So if you look at your last 10 closed deals, this would be a very good action item. Spend 10, 20 minutes on reverse engineer your last 10 closed one deals. And just look at who was involved in these deals, who needed to get involved. And for your next deals, intro calls coming up, et cetera, I cannot tell you how many people don't even do basic LinkedIn sales navigator research and look at, okay, I'm talking to John, VP of sales is so-and-so, chief revenue officer is so-and-so, head of enablement is so-and-so. Now I have names. I can Friend specifically ask for people. So oh, like if your chief time, revenue yeah. officer, is, yep. his name's Tom Alamo, let's say, I don't know yep. where that name come. I'm going to yep. be like, hey, so when we involve Tom, John, in right. a future conversation, typically um, Tom's going to have perspective on how this kind of fits in to the vision over the next one, two, and three years. And we're going to make sure to get alignment there. Um, are you cool? You know, when it comes time looping so-and-so into the conversation, like I want to ask by name yep. and suggest specific people. And the principle there is it's easier to uh, correct than to educate. It's easier for your prospect to correct you than to do all the work of educating you. Mm-hmm. And it's also showing that you're putting some work in. Yep. So come to the table with a hypothesis of who you think the stakeholders are and use that call to validate. And I gave you the talk track earlier. The talk track really is, have you bought this thing before? And if so, uh, how did that work? Who was involved, yep. et cetera, et cetera. And if you haven't, do you want to hear what best in class looks like with our other clients and how this stuff typically comes together? Those are kind of like the two really big fundamental things before you start running the kind of plays and things that happen between the calls. Yeah, because I love that. Because I, I used to, I, even on a cold call, for instance, I, I'll call and I'll say, hi, is, you know, executive there, like the gatekeeper picks up. I'll say, mm-hmm. hi, is Sarah there? And the gatekeeper will say, ah, well, I don't know who's who's calling. And I'll be like, well, this is John with JV Sales. And actually, you know what? Maybe you can help me. You know, I have Sarah's name here, but I'm not exactly sure she's the right person to have this conversation with. This is what we do. Is, you know, is, is, she the, is she the right person? And to your point of correcting versus educating, Oh no, it's not her. It's so and so. Oh, why so and so? Oh, because they do this. Oh, great. Could you patch me through, please? Right now, yeah. you're getting referred from the executive assistant or whoever it is because you're saving them time. But it, yeah. it goes back to like go, not being lazy because you know that's why the who's the best person to speak with about this is such a. It used to work back 15 years ago, right when I was doing this. But yeah. I think that's now a very insulting and ignorant thing to say because it shows mm-hmm. you just have no ability to even open up LinkedIn mm-hmm. and take a fucking guess at who this is because you should be able to figure yep. out by based on some stuff who the person is who should buy this stuff. So you can't be lazy. Exactly. Yeah. So I know we don't have a ton of time left here, but mm-hmm. what are some other th- other ways of multi-threading that, that yeah. you suggest people use to, to spread the audience without pissing off your main point of contact, your champion who thinks... And I think the most dangerous one, by the way, is not the jackass point of contact who's blocking you for everything because then fuck them. I'm going to go do whatever I want to do and see what I can do. I actually think the hardest one is the person that's nice to you. It's like, oh no, Jason, we definitely need this, but, 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 yeah. but, you know, we, we're not going to involve so-and-so yet. And da, 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 da. So how, what are some other ways that you find are effective at multi-threading within organizations? Yeah. So I'll give you some plays and to address the thing that you shared earlier, that's a great insight. Um, I think you need to be willing to get really uncomfortable in conversations. Yep. So I'm, I'm working a deal, it's about 150 K, which is a big training deal for like what we do, at least for me. Yeah, um, and <laughs> the person that I was talking to, she was like in the second call, yeah, let, I'm going to take this ballpark kind of figure you gave me and let me bring that up to my SVP of so-and-so. And I was like, hey, love the excitement. First off, that you're really excited about this. Let's pump the brakes real quick. What I'm really fearful that's going to happen is you seem really excited about this and we're going to bring a dollar figure up to so-and-so with no justification, no cost of inaction, no quantified outcomes that we want to uh, get. And so and so's just going to shoot it down. Are you cool if we pump the brakes on that? I would love to set up another call with you. Let's put a business to get case together first. Boom. Cool. 
She just needed to be educated. That was really uncomfortable for me to do. Yeah. This happened a couple of months ago. You know what I mean? It's always uncomfortable to like tell someone that they're wrong. And there's yeah. elegant ways you can do that, of course. Uh-huh. So other plays that you can run, I think a really simple one is if you get a lot of first meetings with people that are managers of something, so sales enablement manager for me, let's say, uh-huh. I'm going to reach out to who I think the economic buyer is and who I think a good champion is. And medic lingo is really good for this. Champion versus coach, really important distinction. Yes. Champion is typically an executive who has direct access to an economic buyer. So for in our world, that's a VP of sales. Wow. <laughs> sales manager, yep. that's not your champion. They can be a great coach. Yep. They can give you a lot of great insight, but they're not meeting with a CRO on a weekly basis. Right. So that distinction is super important. One thing that you can do before that first meeting with the manager is send an email to who you think the economic buyer might be. Uh, VP of sales, I'm going to say, hey, John, just let you know a few people from your team, I'm not going to mention names because I haven't talked to those people yet, are meeting with us to discuss X, Y, Z. No need for you to respond. No ask here. I'll keep you in the loop. That's it. All I'm going to do. Now I've opened up a thread of communication and I've promised the person I'm going to keep them up to date. Mm -hmm. So after that meeting, after I've had the multi-threading conversation, I'm going to reach out again to John and say, Mm -hmm. hey, call went really well with so-and-so today. By the way, I want to say they're really on top of their numbers, seem really aligned with the vision. Here's what we talked about and what I understand your priorities to be. Bullet A, bullet B. Again, no need for a response here. Just keeping you looped in. Okay. And imagine you do that three or four times. And now when it does come time to engage the chief revenue officer or the VP of sales, they already know mm-hmm. who I am because you know what they're likely going to do after getting those emails a couple of times is forward it over to that person or ask, who the hell is this Jason guy? Right. And now I've like warmed up the oven, so to speak. I've preheated the oven. So that's one really simple thing that you can do like prior to that first call to like get a lot of in- engagement and, and and especially just getting people talking about it. Yeah. Do you, have you ever have you ever gotten a negative response? I yes. mean, I, probably every yep. once in a while, but yeah. on average you get probably put mostly pretty positive on that. Yeah. Uh one of them, he I all I did was send a LinkedIn connection request. This just happened uh to his VP who he said that he was already talking to about me right. as a director of business development. And I was like, hey, so-and-so, have been having some great conversations with John. No ask yep. here. Would love to connect. That's it. He emailed me back, it. canceled our meeting. Yeah, he got super pissed. I know there's no deal there, though. I, I saved yeah, myself exactly. a bunch of time. Exactly. There was no deal. He was like fanboying me, basically. You know? Well, and, it's, and it also shows that there's that's probably not your buyer anyways, because like in general, from a com- from a client standpoint, because they don't agree with your philosophy, right? If somebody, if you're doing yep. something that aligns with your philosophy and they have <laughs> such a negative reaction to it for you, somebody like you and me, that's a death yep. blow because it's like, that means you just don't get it and you're yeah. going to hate what I have to offer here. So I like yeah. that. And I think that's a softer way of doing it. So instead of sending the email, you send a LinkedIn request to the leader saying, hey, you know what? Just want to yep. let you know I'm having a great conversation. And you know, if you have any questions, yep. let me know. I like that a lot. So there's the awesome. pre-email and then there's yep. the threading and keeping that person looped in. And then another yep. one that I, I feel like does not get pulled off well is how to start incorporating your leadership. This is a more advanced tactic. Yep. So if I'm selling to CIOs, ghostwriting an email for my CIO to send to them. Oh, okay. Yep. This requires a lot of... Like <laughs> you got to be on the same page with your CIO. There has to be something that your leadership has put into place for stuff like this. And this is usually reserved for large enterprise deals. Yeah. yeah. So you can get a deal unstuck that way. And you can also proactively, like a lot of my clients, I used to be very against this, but I don't really care anymore. Like their sales yeah. managers have a VP title. Yeah. I'm like, okay, it's kind of cool, I guess. Cause like yeah. their prospect, they'll send a, an email over saying, Hey, I heard our two teams had a great conversation around these topics. Yeah. No need for uh, a response here. I just want to put it out there that we're a resource for you and happy to support this project. Okay. And I'm like, like looping in my leadership. So I think multi-threading happens on your side. Gong's got a lot of interesting stuff around this too. But if there were like two or three things that you started doing immediately, it would be uh, research stakeholders in advance ask for them by name on the call and keep people looped in by email. Like let your point of contact know that you're emailing other people yeah. and keeping them in the loop. Just be totally open and transparent about everything. And then that's going to expose a lot of cracks in the deal. And it'll let you know how real a deal is because prospects don't socialize as good as you think that they do. Oftentimes they don't talk about it at all. So this is the thing sometimes that could just get them to have that internal conversation where like, 
who know? the heck is this guy that keeps emailing me about this project that you yeah. two are talking about? Oh yeah, it's yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. And then, like now it's a real conversation. I love those. And I think, you know, we could have, we could keep talking about, you know, the, the going down and how to engage as far as what to say to those people. Yeah. But I know we're coming up on time here. So let's leave a little <laughs> bit to, to on the bone here for people to either go find out more information uh, from, from your site or, or tune yeah. into the next time here. So Jason, you got a ton of free content out there. Uh, where, where do you want to direct people? Cause you're doing some really cool stuff and you get super tactical. I mean, you give away a ton of free shit, which, yeah. uh, which I genuinely appreciate. So where can people find out more? No, it's been awesome. Always, always fun to jam with you, man. Um, yeah. Outboundsquad.com is the best place. So cool. that's kind of a hub for a couple of things. We have a podcast also, Outbound Squad Podcast. I post daily content on LinkedIn. And then there's also programs in there. Um, if you're an account executive, especially, and you're looking for help implementing some of the stuff that we talked about, we have for, yeah. you know, an online platform, there's coaching options. If you're a sales leader, there's all kinds of stuff there too. But uh, I think the best way to get into our ecosystem is on that, on that website, outboundsquad.com. Love it. And easy enough for everybody is Jason Bay. He goes by J Bay, but uh, Jason Bay on LinkedIn, it's pretty easy to find. So Jason, always a pleasure, man. I appreciate you coming on here, man. I'm looking forward to seeing what else we can do together moving forward. Yeah, you're coming on the podcast, uh, on my podcast next. So looking forward to jamming with you again, man. Yes, indeed. I'm looking forward to that, man. Awesome, everybody. Well, look, thank you very much. Hopefully you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As usual, look, go out there and make somebody smile today because no matter how bad your day went or you think it's going, Make somebody smile today. You know you had a good day and the world needs a lot more of that right now. So thank you all very much and I will see you on the other side. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. With your support and our incredible guests, we're one of the top sales podcasts out there right now and I can't thank you enough. Now to keep the momentum going, it would mean the world to me if you could go and leave a five-star review on your favorite podcast platform and share some of your favorite episodes with your network. Also, check out my new website at www.johnmsmichaelbarrows.com, where you'll find even more ways to engage. There's a ton of free content, and you can also get trained from me directly as an individual or for your team. Look, I'm out there selling every day just like you are, and I'm doing my best to stay on top of all the latest trends in technology. So if you're looking to level up and you give a shit about this profession of sales, let's connect and let's make this happen together.